All right, uh, hey everyone, welcome to uh, our talk today. We're gonna be talking about uh, multi-cluster stateful set migrations uh, and how they can solve some of your upgrade pains. Um, my name is Matt, I'm a software engineer at Chronosphere where I work on the infrastructure team dealing with all things storage, reliability, scalability. Uh, and for Chronosphere, I was an SRE at Uber on the observability platform there. And I'm Peter, I work at Google on stateful workloads on GKE. So I deal with storage, drivers that GKE uses for connecting to storage infrastructure. Uh, so a little general idea of what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm um, gonna give you a bit of context on uh, how we use Kubernetes at Chronosphere, uh, some of the use cases and challenges we have with uh, cross-cluster stateful workloads. Uh, Peter is going to tell you about some of the work going on in open source Kubernetes to uh, make these use cases possible, and we're going to show you a demo of how it all ties together. So first, to give you a little bit of context about uh, what Chronosphere does and how we use Kubernetes, um, Chronosphere is a software as a service observability platform, uh, particularly built for high scale use cases in cloud native environments. And given how mission critical observability is, uh, we have a really high SLA and we take reliability incredibly seriously to meet that SLA. Uh, so although we have three nines uh, in our SLA, we aim for four nines and have achieved four nines in production. Uh, part of the way that we achieve these reliability and uh, fault tolerance needs is by running on top of Kubernetes. So our Kubernetes footprint uh, spans multiple regions with thousands of Kubernetes nodes in total and over 40,000 pods in total. Each of these clusters run a mix of stateless and stateful workloads, um, but the largest stateful workload is our metrics data store, which I'm gonna tell you more about. So the architecture of our metrics data store really heavily influences uh, how we operate it, how we deploy about it, or sorry, how we operate it, how we think about it, deploy it, and kind of uh, architect our clusters for it. So our metrics data store is based on M3, which is an open source metrics engine, and uh, metrics data store clusters are deployed as three separate stateful sets, each in a separate zone, and each having a full copy of the data. Uh, so data is sharded and uh, sharded across multiple nodes in a stateful set, uh, and then each stateful set owns an entire copy of the data. All reads and writes are done through client-side quorum, so when you go to write uh, data as long as two of the three nodes that own that shard acknowledge the write and persist it on disk, then we consider the write successful, a uh, similar pattern for reads. But because all this quorum is done client side, uh, it means that the clients have to be aware of each unique database node in the cluster, have to be able to open a connection to it, and have to be able to individually address each database node. Um, so you might be used to some systems like uh, Cassandra, where, is there, where there's the concept of uh, hinted handoff or kind of coordinating rights between database nodes. Um, in our database, there's none of that. It's all done on the client side. Uh, so we have a number of kind of robust operational workflows um, and general day-to-day -day workflows that are uniquely aware of the database's architecture, uh, its replication strategy, and uh, fault and uh, quorum requirements. So for example, things like moving a database cluster between node pools, coordinating resizing of the underlying storage, uh, or upgrading the uh, database cluster. But there have been times where we've wanted to move one of our metrics data stores between Kubernetes clusters, and the complexity was that was gonna be involved pretty much required us to find alternatives. Um, any design that we came up with was going to involve deleting stateful sets with an or with the orphan propagation policy, and then manually moving nodes between clusters and hoping that there were no other disruptions in the meantime. Um, anything was gonna be kind of a disaster. Um, and you know, if you lost other pods during the migration, then you could lose quorum. Uh, so we had to find alternatives. 
And in terms of why you might want to do this, why you might want to move a stateful workload between clusters, um, there can be a number of reasons. A lot of organizations will start off with just one or two production Kubernetes clusters um, and uh, over time have to split up those workloads. So maybe your cluster has, maybe your Kubernetes cluster has grown too large and you're worried about control plane scalability um, or maybe you just want to reduce the blast radius of any one uh, Kubernetes control plane failure. Um, either way, you, end, you might want to end up splitting your workloads across multiple clusters. Um, you might also have to move workloads from one region to another. So maybe you need some data to be in a specific region for compliance or data severity purposes, uh, or maybe you just want to move some data closer to your users. Uh, maybe you have a large user segment in a new geography and you want your data to be as close to them as possible. There are also uh, some cloud provider features that might only be available on new clusters that you might want to take advantage of, or maybe you're re-architecting your clusters, um, or you're swapping out kind of low-level components, like maybe you're changing your CNI implementation, uh, and kind of doing that on a live cluster can be like changing the engine of a plane mid-flight and kind of terrifying. And if you find yourself in the situation of wanting to move workloads between clusters, um, for stateless workloads, there are a number of solutions that the community has come up with that make moving workloads between clusters easier. Um, the most notable ones are multi-cluster services and multi-cluster ingresses, both of which are implemented by multiple open source service meshes as well as uh, cloud provider implementations. So if you're running a purely stateless workload, then you can just bring up a new Kubernetes cluster, bring up your workloads in that cluster, and then, shift, and then shift traffic over to them using one of these tools. Um, but for stateful workloads, the story isn't really as clear. And for our workload specifically, given the uh, requirement of the client having to address each database node, um, we can't just put a load balancer in front of a stateful set and then move them over and call it a day. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges you may face with performing a cross-cluster migration. Um, so we have the complexity of managing multiple Kubernetes control planes. If you're running in a single Kubernetes cluster, you have a bunch of invariants that your API server will enforce. You have uniqueness guarantees per pod. You have um, at most one semantics of a stateful set, and those are enforced through API server. Now, if we're dealing with m migrating a logical application across clusters, you're dealing with two API servers. So you're managing state across um, two API servers, two clusters. You don't have the same invariance. So um, that's, that's one of the main, main challenges here. And we're going to cover like, both this, orchestration, networking, and storage. Um, but this is kind of a, cement, a, a illustration here of, say, a migration. You have um, a migration that's partly underway. Um, you have some, some subset of replicas in a new cluster, um, and you're, you're scaling down replicas in an old cluster um, while still referencing uh, your storage layer between the clusters. So let's talk about network first. What are the challenges here? Um, first one is clients need access to um, updated application endpoints. So as Matt mentioned, um, clients of M3DB need to be able to uniquely address the replicas that are running. Um, and so for this, you need to have a way for clients to discover replicas as they turn up in a new cluster. Um, so usually clients will communicate um, through a cluster IP or balancer or through a headless service within the cluster. Um, but since we're moving across clusters, we need some other sort of solution um, to handle that. Um, the, other, the other issue is peer discovery. So peers need a reliable, stable endpoint to connect to um, or a discovery service to determine which replicas are currently available. Um, so in a single cluster, you know, there is, peers are assigned with the same DNS endpoint. Um, the name's consistent, even though an IP address might change as pod lifecycle um, changes. Um, and DNS updates are almost instant, thanks to kube proxy. Um, but across clusters, replicas, um, even though you're, they're uniquely addressable, they may not have consistent DNS naming um, based on the, your service mesh of choice and the, the fully qualified domain name might not be consistent. So that's, that's something that we need to account for. Um, and then finally, when we're actually migrating an application, 
We don't want to have to re-architect our application to support cross clusters. Um, there may be some changes that we need to do to use a different peer discovery endpoint, um, but we don't want to actually have to modify the application significantly um, before we incorporate this cl cross cluster move because that's just a bunch of extra engineering that we don't want to do. Um, so that's another constraint of the system. Um, the other challenge here is storage. So um, we have uh, typical applications may, may use, um, I guess for read write many, that's fairly simple because we have application uh, storage that may be accessible across both clusters just through a network endpoint that stays consistent. Um, but if we're using read write once, we need to make sure that our storage references um, are able to be shared across clusters. Um, so let's consider this case where, say, we have an application that's using a persistent disk um, in one cluster, and how do we get the other cluster to re recognize that persistent disk and use it um, once it's no longer being used in the original cluster if we're moving over a replica? Um, so we need to have a way to have this data be accessible across both, cl both clusters, or at least this data reference. Um, and within a single cluster, PVs are a global resource. Um, but now that we are kind of breaking out of the cluster and going outside of the cluster boundary, we need to still enforce this invariant. Um, so that's another challenge we have to, we have to handle. Um, so yeah, API server isn't enforcing the PV to PVC uniqueness, so we need the orchestration layer to handle that, something that's outside of the cluster that's able to make sure the application still obeys these semantics we want it to obey, even though we don't have the invariants um, of, that API server is enforcing. Um, and finally, the major challenge here is orchestration. Um, so there's a, a number of things we need to think about. Number one is um, replicas need to follow storage. So if we're using dynamic provisioning, um, if we simply scale down replicas in a source cluster and bring them up in a destination cluster, um, and we're using dynamic provisioning, uh, we may get volumes provision that we don't want. And really we wanna have our data layer be migrated. Um, so storage, replicas need to follow storage and we need to bring up storage in the new cluster so that our application can access it in the, in the destination cluster. Um, the other challenge is pod disruption budget. So how do we make sure that during a migration, any infrastructure changes, maybe a cluster update or um, maintenance events don't affect the application and don't disrupt the budget of the global application that's kind of logically running across both clusters. So we need some way to um, enforce a pod disruption budget or maintain a certain budget of availability um, while we're migrating. Um, and the other challenge is uh, with network. So we touched on that. We need some way to have um, clients be able to connect and peers able to connect to other peers. Um, but the mechanism that we're using, as I mentioned, you know, cube, cube proxy is very quick. You know, we can update a DNS endpoint and all of a sudden the pod IP will get reflected there. But if we're using a service mesh that spans cross clusters, our DNS updates might not propagate as quickly as kube proxy. So we need some way of signaling to our orchestration system that maybe a DNS endpoint isn't ready um, to be served for clients, and we need to wait for that to happen. Um, so that's another thing we need to be aware of. Um, the other challenge is with if we're using an operator, um, the op an operator typically will um, reconcile to an, a particular state. So if we have some orchestration that's sitting outside of a cluster that's moving replicas over in the stateful set, um, we need to have the operator remain in sync with what we're doing. Um, if we simply you know, move replicas from a stateful set, um, an operator will try to reconcile back to its um, specified state. So we need to have some way to either have that operator be aware of the migration or um, let an operator know that we're scaling down. Um, and not to get in the way and fight over stateful set resources. So I'm gonna talk about some of, the, some of the ways in open source we can maybe tackle these problems. Um, so the first building block I'm gonna introduce is multi-cluster services. Um, and so this is KEP 1645. Um, it's introduced in 2020. Um, and it provides a specification for cross-cluster domain naming. Um, so the benefit we get here, um, if we look at peer discovery, that one problem I talked about before, um, is that we can use a headless service, a headless multi-cluster service, 
to uniquely, to allow replicas across clusters to be uniquely identifiable. So that solves this problem of having um, unique identity, but also having a discovery service. So if we query the discovery service, similar to a headless service within the cluster, um, we can discover all of the peers that are behind this multi-cluster headless service. Um, and then for client networking, um, as Matt mentioned, M3DB has this constraint of clients needing access uniquely to uh, replicas. Um, multi-cluster services provides us a way to uniquely address these, uh, these endpoints. Um, as long as they're qualified by the, the cluster ID um, that these replicas are in. So addition, in addition to that, yeah, we, we have this uniqueness um, provided by multi-cluster services and we have some way to discover um, these endpoints. Um, the other building block I want to introduce is um, stateful set slices. So this is a new cap um, that we're working on for 126 and we're targeting alpha. Um, but at its core, it's a way of um, segmenting a stateful set into um, a subset of, of replica IDs. So it enables um, you to take a stateful set of say like n replicas and split it into two um, to have like a, a set that um, you can scale down in a source cluster and scale up in a destination cluster um, in a complementary fashion. So one of the challenges of the stateful sets today is you know, they, they, if you're using ordered ready, they scale from zero to n, and they scale down from n to zero. Um, if we simply scale down in cluster A and then try to scale up in cluster B, we're gonna be scaling up from zero. And so we have an overlap of replicas. Um, but with this cap, we're able to kind of provide more granular control over those replica ordinals um, and scale in from replica n and down to zero in the, in the destination cluster. So we can have a complementary slice to the one that we've just scaled down in cluster A. So how do we tie these together to build a solution from, for cross-cluster migration? Um, so we need to coordinate the building blocks. Um, we need to m leverage multi-cluster endpoints um, or incorporate a peer discovery protocol um, that allows for communication across these clusters. Um, we need applications to provide signals that they're healthy, um, whether that's the application finding quorum from its peers um, if DNS propagation is an issue, making sure that uh, the application is able to notify us when its client endpoints are ready. Um, we have to make sure that operators can coexist with application orchestration. Um, and we need to, if you're using, say, like a CI CD pipeline for managing your stateful sets, you need some way to signal to that um, so that you don't have contention between migration and. Uh, and your GitOps, GitOps workload. Um, and then we also need to migrate our dependencies over. So um, this is our storage layer or our config apps that we're referencing. Um, those need to be moved over to the other clusters so that we can bring up our stateful set um, in, in cluster B. So we're gonna showcase a demo here of M3DB migration um, and some context on this demo. So. We're running M3DB across three zones, so we have three stateful sets. Uh, we're gonna migrate these one by one, so one per zone. Um, and in this demo, we're using multi-cluster services on GKE. Um, for the orchestration of these stateful sets, we're using CAP 335, so it's a modified Kubernetes cluster that has this enhancement. Um, and then to move the migration over, both of these clusters are running in the same zone, so they're the same, or the same region, so they have the same zonal footprint. Um, so as you, as you migrate our storage references over, we're still referencing the same underlying persistent disk. Um, and so as long as our compute resources match the storage resources, um, our replicas are able to come up as um, our storage gets attached to the, the compute resources in the new cluster. Um, so we're gonna roll this demo here and I'm just gonna talk through it as we go. So we're just kicking off this with a CRD. So on the left here, we have our source cluster, and that's running a 3DB. On the right, we have a destination cluster that doesn't have anything in it. Um, and so orchestration just kicked off, and it started scaling down the source stateful set and bringing up the destination stateful set. And as I mentioned, um, replicas need to follow storage. So the first thing we did was migrate the storage references. So taking those PV, PVC, config map dependencies, 
and moving those over to the destination cluster. Um, once that happened, we were able to create a new stateful set that referenced um, one of these, uh, one, of the, one of the replicas that we wanted to migrate over. So we migrated over um, the, one of the zones. Um, if the stateful set had more replicas, we would scale in the highest replica first. Um, but we, we're just moving over stateful sets of replica size one um, in order to fit it on the screen here. And at the top, we have um, the commit log traffic for our M3DB application. So we can see as replicas are scaled down, um, our traffic scales down to that particular replica. Um, and we start to see as DNS propagates, we can see there, um, traffic starts to scale up on the destination cluster. Um, and so I've sped up the demo and cut out kind of the boring sections where we're waiting for uh, our DNS names to propagate to our clients. Um, but in effect, we're able to showcase how that scales up and scales down and clients are able to get updated endpoints um, as we're migrating over. This is a little glitch in Kube Proxy. Um, we just had to restart it here, but our application's back up. Um, and we'll just wait for the final instance to come healthy and then that should be the, the end of the demo there. So um, the other thing to mention is for, for readiness, what we're using here is pod readiness gates to denote that a pod is ready. Um, and we can tie in the network piece here as well. Um, so once that endpoint becomes ready with our multi-cluster DNS name, um, then we can signal the pod health, propagate that up to stateful set health, and then our orchestrator is able to know it's safe to, 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 to move on to the next um, replica or the next zone, depending how we configured migration. Okay, so what's next? Um, so safety, um, that's one thing I didn't really touch on, but I did mention as a constraint, we need to make, manage budget across our clusters. So making sure we've protected our application across clusters, we're modifying the pod reception budget in a distributed way so that both clusters have a uh, global view of budget and we maintain budget um, if there's any maintenance events. Um, increasing the speed, so aligning our unavailability budget with failure domains. Um, in this case, we're mo moving one zone at a time um, because that's kind of the constraint of M3DB. Um, we need two out of three zones up in order to handle writes. Um, but we can speed this up based on failure domains. Maybe we take one zone down at a time or uh, maybe we can handle a subset of replicas with, within a single zone and we wanna have a max unavailable per zone that we're managing at a time. Um, data flexibility, so being able to move data across regions, you know, this demo just showed moving across a single zone, we're still referencing the same underlying disk. But you can imagine, you know, instead of using that same disk reference, rather than just uh, using it directly, and we, if we want to migrate across, across zones, we could um, replicate that underlying storage to another zone and then bring up a new replica in the other zone. So, there is some additional challenges here in terms of network latency if we have the other cluster in another region um, during the migration. So, you know, this would probably want, you'd probably want to do this only during a period of lower traffic, um, during a regular maintenance window. Um, and then finally, operator compatibility, so supporting general operators. So for this demo, we made some um, changes to make the M3DB operator multi-cluster aware. Um, but we do want to make some improvements in open source to kind of have uh, specification for multiple, op like generic operators kind of tie into to handle this operation. So how do we signal between um, orchestration systems that are outside of clusters to operators within clusters um, that orchestration should be deferred to another, another controller? Um, so that's kind of the idea here, making it multi-cluster aware. Um, then I'll hand it back to Matt for closing up. All right, so uh, that's about it that we have. Uh, if you want to come hear more about uh, stateful set war stories, I will be at the uh, Kernos Hero booth today, which is right near the GCP booth, so you can find Peter as well. Um, and we will take some time for questions now as well. Looks like we have a, we have a hand up in like row six over there. Thank you. Uh, 
So how do you handle the uh, dependency in, in between two applications? So as an example, I have an application which is kind of dependent on other applications, and that application needs to be migrated first to the second cluster. Yeah, so for dependencies, um, like in this example, M3DB has a dependency on etcd. Um, and so in this scenario, we configured etcd to be multi-cluster, to be behind a multi-cluster endpoint, and M3DB was communicating with etcd through its multi-cluster domain name. Um, and so as M3DB migrated, etcd remained in the source cluster. Um, what, what you can do after you've migrated, say, that um, application, or maybe you migrate your dependency first, like we could have migrated etcd first and then migrated M3DB, um, or vice versa. But we do need to think about like which pieces, which building blocks do we want to migrate um, a, a, as we're going. And with like the applications do need to be multi-cluster uh, available to kind of have this cross-cluster dependency be resolved. Hey, um, I have a question here. Oh, by the way, thanks for the great talk. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to understand is how do we kind of, are there today provisions to cut off uh, traffic for stateful workloads in the sense that if I wanted to ensure that in-flight rights are persisted to the backing store, uh, are there hooks to ensure that those are flushed before we kind of move over? Um, and what kind of support do we have within the... I, I'm just going to step up here in front of the monitor so I can hear a bit better. Okay. Uh, so as we migrate workloads, one of the things that we want to ensure that uh, data that is written um, mm -hmm. onto one of the stateful states is fully written. So mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to ensure that writes on the final destination store are complete? Is there a way, is there some mechanism to ensure that that is notified before the orchestrator kind of kicks off and moves it over to the other uh, cluster? Yeah. What kind of mechanisms do we have on the, um, on the, you know, the Kubernetes control plane to, um, uh, you know, ensure that this is done. Yeah, so if we're concerned about data consistency from a single replica, yeah. um, what, one thing we can do is make sure that our application has the right um, primitives and built-ins to make sure we're flushing that data to our rewrite once disk as it's being terminated. So that means setting up appropriate um, graceful termination windows um, so that we can gracefully terminate and flush our writes to that disk um, before we actually migrate the replica. So, as, as long as we kind of have that API semantics of allowing like the Kubernetes API to take down a pod and have it terminate gracefully, um, we can control orchestration safely and have that uh, consistent set of data written to the disk before we bring up um, a new replica starting on the new cluster. Because effectively, if we're using the same disk reference, it's no different than say a pod being restarted um, for like a maintenance or an application upgrade or a termination event. Also, in this example, the uh, workload migration controller uh, gives feedback to any operator that's observing it about where you are in the migration. So if you build your application to kind of be aware of when it's being migrated or when the thing that your operator is controlling is being migrated, um, then it doesn't just have to be this opaque migration. You can kind of inform your application and, you know, like you said, shut it down to uh, ensure that like all writes have been flushed or something before it moves. Okay, thank you, Peter. Oh, we, one more question over oh. there, if, if we have time. Can you raise your hand? So within a single cluster, the attached attached controller is responsible for making sure read write once volumes are attached only to one node. Mm -hmm. Going forward, like how how's attached attached controller across both clusters are going to work together to? Yeah, so that that's one of the challenges I mentioned that these invariants that are enforced in a single cluster today. Um, they're not enforced across clusters. So whatever is doing your migration, so whatever is orchestrating your migration outside of the clusters needs to make sure that those invariants are logically um, kept, even though there's no way to enforce it through API server. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of dealing with like a split brain scenario because there's two attached attached controllers right. running in two separate control planes. Um, so it's really on the, the orchestrator to make sure that we've safely shut down a pod and that disk is no longer attached um, to that VM. So there, we do need to make sure that like our signaling is appropriate for termination state when a pod is actually um, brought down before we bring it up in a new cluster. 
There nice. also are kind of some safety checks. You know, most storage limitations, whether it's a cloud provider or something else, like they won't let you attach a read write one disk in multiple places. So worst case, you get an error and hopefully not just totally corrupted application state. Thank you. Just on the same note, I have another question. Um, on stateful set, uh, if your application is so close to attached to uh, this, in this case is a DB, and we are not going for cluster migration, we are going for blue-green for that specific DB schema change. Mm -hmm. How we will do that? Because existing DB is still supporting, and we need to spin up, and we need to validate the new DB schema. Is that something you have? thought about? Yeah, so. Blue-green kind of scenario. Of so, so this here is kind of like, we're, we're both migrating to a new cluster, and we're also doing an application upgrade at the same time, right? Yeah, so I, I agree. That definitely adds like additional complexity. Um, so I think that's, it's, it's not something that we showcase in this demo. Um, and I think it can be done under the right safety protocols. Um, but it certainly is a bit of a challenge, because usually when you migrate a database schema to an updated version, you can't roll back, say for MySQL, you update minor version, you can't roll back to the previous minor version, it's just not supported. Um, so I, I think that in, to ensure safety and kind of like uh, isolate some of the changes to your system, um, it's better to do these updates separately so that you're kind of minimizing this, like the benefit of moving across clusters is you can, you can, you can roll back if we have the same database schema across clusters, but um, Doing this, doing this upgrade does kind of introduce risk and kind of um, makes the, the rollback option um, no longer possible. So it's kind of like reducing the safety of this, uh, this cross-cluster migration anyway, so. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.